Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us today at the end of a very long day for you and a bit of an early start for us here in Australia. Uh, today we have a panel, panel of industry experts and teachers from the Australian College of the Arts, better known to us as ColArts, um, who will discuss their perspective on how artists build their communities and connect to fans. So we have on the panel Matt Walters, and he's the founder of Parlour Gig, so which you may have heard of. It's a platform that allows artists to book house shows directly with their fans, helping to open up additional revenue and grow their fan base. So Parlour has facilitated thousands of gigs around the world and generated millions of dollars for its artists since commencing in 2015. So Matt is also the founder of a Web3 startup called Memento, which is a new way for creators, including performing artists, writers, sports people, and the like to connect directly to their fans, build community with their fan base and reward their fans and supporters for their support in ways that can't be done in traditional social media platforms. So welcome, Matt. We look forward to hearing more about that. I'd also like to introduce Jess Carroll who is an educator, researcher and communications professional. She has worked with the entertainment industry throughout her career and currently works as the program coordinator of Bachelor of Applied Business Entertainment Management at CollArts. And she's worked with commercial clients, artists, independent labels, brands, not-for-profits, and in communicating, presenting projects to the public. She began her career as a music manager and Jess then focused her to attention on developing and promoting music events and artists to the Australian public. So Jess teaches creative entrepreneurship, talent management and portfolio. I struggle saying entrepreneurship as much as I struggle to spell it. <laughs> it's one of those words I have to type every day and always get it wrong. Uh, have we got Laura? Yes, we have Laura. And I just, so Laura Semple is our final panelist and she is the founder of Melbourne based music PR and social media agency Hunger Digital. So um, Laura did her Masters of Communication thesis on the importance of posting on social media outside a release cycle. So I look forward to hearing more about that. And Laura, te um, I like Laura has a slogan creating chatter that matters so that's <laughs> i like that and she lectures contemporary marketing at collarts and where she provides her in-depth knowledge of social media and marketing and pr to aid music art artists and music focused businesses build connections between themselves and their audiences so welcome laura matt and jess i'm katie richards from collarts and I'm the head of the industry awareness stream and I'm also on the MIA board. And I have my colleague, Chrissy Vincent with me today, who is the head of entertainment management at CollArts and she's the Australasian representative on the MIA board as well. So welcome everybody. So Matt, I'd like to get started with you. Can you tell us a little bit about Parlour, give us some background on that and how that then led to Memento? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I guess Parlour started with conversations with my artist friends. I had spent, personally, I'd spent my 20s um, touring around the world um, at, at a loss, um, playing shows at the drop of a hat, that kind of thing, um, touring through North America on the smell of an oily rag. Um, and through that experience, made lots of artist friends here and around the world. Um, and I noticed a similar sort of recurring conversation um, as we sort of um, sort of initiated the streaming age. So artists would say to me, I've got all these fans, um, you know, on social media or, um, you know, I can see that people are listening to me in all these other places around the world. I don't know what to do with this information. Um, and then a secondary conversation was around, um, you know, the, the sort of frustration around, you um, connecting with people on social media, trying to build a digital community and not quite being sure how to do that. Um, and so Parla, um, I'm sort of, I, I guess we just had this idea that, well, what if you could just go and play directly for the people um, that, that loved your music wherever they are. So Parla finds one um, big fan, one we call them super fans, and that super fan sells tickets to their friends and family for this special house show 
um, uh, wherever that may be. And so it allows artists to go and sort of, I guess, initially use technology to make the connection with the Parlor app and social media, but then um, build sort of real and tangible community with these sort of real human connections. Um, and we found that to be a recipe that kind of, you know, has worked for a lot of artists in the sort of digital age to sort of, yeah, I guess, meld that digital um, experience with an in-person experience outside of the traditional show, you know, um, venue sort of shows that artists do. Um, and how that led to Memento, um, I meant I'm just really interested in Web3 technology and what the future of communicating with fans looks like. And so Memento is very nascent. We have a white paper and we're building the first version of the platform right now. Um, but we're really interested in, uh, right, you know, right now we have sort of a broadcasting model with social media. So sort of like sending information out, people comment, what do the future um, artist and fan relationships look like um, in a sort of Web3 um, paradigm? So using blockchain and things like that and social tokens um, and NFTs, um, how, you know, how will... Um, artists and fans be communicating and how will value be exchanged um, in the future. So that's a, a bit of a ramble for you. <laughs> is, is that a challenge, the, your biggest challenge, would you say, is having to keep abreast of what it, will the future look like and what, what is technology that you're going to use to communicate to fans? Um, certainly not a challenge. I, I personally enjoy it um, and, you know, I'm constantly interested in the developments and, and something like Memento, we're looking five, ten years down the line really, um, hopefully not ten years, may, maybe five, um, with, with, with how, yeah, with, with how these artist-fan relationships are going to um, evolve. Awesome. Thank you. And right. Jess, just think over to you, just thinking about the future on that topic, um, what skills do you think will be important for cultivating and connecting to community in the future? So uh, I guess one of the things that my, yeah, my experience is, has been more recently um, in teaching students um, how to build community and kind of giving them practical applications and real life experiences. Um, and I guess one of the challenges that I see uh, with, you know, building community and teaching students how to build community is to shift their understanding from, uh, I guess, their personal worlds um, and actually starting to look at uh, the, the, the talent or the people that they're working with um, and to be able to engage with the communities in a business sense. Um, so I think, you know, I've definitely found... Um, that students have a really good understanding of different platforms. They have are very familiar with how, um, you know, different tools work or they've, you know, been exposed to the tool. So I guess with that exposure comes um, a sense of familiarity, but they haven't necessarily haven't necessarily approached it in a strategic way where they've, uh, you know, developed a, a really, you know, comprehensive plan or tested and trialled different ideas um, and, and looked at how, you know, what works and, and kind of approached it with that experimentation. So I think in terms of future skills, I think, um, you know, I see, uh, you know, a real um, synergy between you know, analytical thinking and being able to read, uh, you know, and analyse information um, in its different forms. So being able to understand data. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, you know, data, you know, when you, depending what tool and how it's kind of presented, you know, it, it, there's so many different ways that you can interact with data depending on the questions that you're asking it. So um, I think um, for students, it's having that, that, that understanding of, of, you know, looking at something, you know, having a question, trying to figure out what the answer to that question is um, and how that relates to, again, applying it to their talent or applying it to their project or business venture um, and, and being, you know, creative um, thinkers as well. Because I think one of the things that, uh, you know, in the future, um, I think 
with with this amazing um, you know change in 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 what kind of tools we have available to us, um, you know, it's you can you can be you can find out so many different um, answers to questions, and you know, like we, at Collarts, we use um, Chartmetric. Um, you know, we encourage our students to use that tool um, as a way of kind of finding information and understanding the communities that already exist. Um, but there's so many different ways that you can use that kind of tool or, or different, you know, platforms to actually figure out what you want to uh, build or what you want to do um, and how you connect with with um, with fans. So I think, yeah, creativity, research, and, um, you know, having, I guess, an analytical approach of, um, you know, to experimentation, um, that's probably, you know, those future skills that I see. So that's interesting um, that you bring that up because we got feedback from students, not necessarily for your class, but it did make us smile a little bit. It, and the feedback from their last trimester was, I don't care about Roblox or the metaverse or Facebook. What does that have to do with marketing? So how do you deal with that kind of feedback from a student? Uh, I think it's it's really interesting because you're you're talking uh, as well about it's it's how do you open up the world to that student? So I guess um, you know asking questions is a really good thing to kind of get them to be prompted to come to their own conclusions as well. But it's really that's that's the challenge for for teaching is really how to um, you know make this the future real for them in the classroom and also like I was sort of saying that shift between their personal experience into actually you know looking at it from a business sense and getting them to step out of their own experiences and actually look at well how does this apply to this particular context or practical application and um, I think something that I try to do in my teaching practices to provide those real world experiences for the students. So, you know, uh, in, in one of the classes that I teach, um, applied talent management, um, students are kind of exposed to, you know, they have the uh, autonomy to choose the person or people that they want to work with. And through that come the experiences that they then find themselves. So it's not necessarily, you know, I'll, I'll, I will guide them along the way and, and we kind of have, I guess, a mentoring relationship where um you know uh we can talk about you know where you know where does if, if there's someone you know in a a space that you know leads them to you know working with a, a new marketing practice um you know that's that's something that you know we'll, we'll look to but um I think it's it's kind of very much led to yes straddling the, the present and and also looking to the future um and kind of getting them uh you know shifting that their frame of uh, frame of um, context as well. Excellent. Thank you. And Laura, so going, um, sticking to the topic of the various tools that uh, students use, you, when you started your career 10 years ago, Instagram existed, but probably wasn't used like it is today. So what changes have you seen and what do you uh, get students to engage with? Because you teach applied digital marketing, right? Yeah, contemporary um, marketing. So mainly focusing on that digital social media side, mixing and I guess a little bit of PR and stuff. But I guess for me, and it's it's really good that I've sort of started when yeah, Facebook was heavily used for marketing with advertising and everything. Instagram was a new platform on the ground and there was no Insta stories. You couldn't advertise. It was just putting content. And so I've been able to see the progression of various social media platforms, platforms that have come in and haven't worked and disappeared and TikTok changing and everything like that. And I try and use those real world examples for the students. And even when I did my master's, um, Instagram stories wasn't a thing until about week three of doing my master's like thesis. So I had to scrap sort of everything and change how that was going to work. And I think being able to teach the students that, yes, they may not see a platform as being really useful at the moment, but we have to think about, okay, well, how has that platform adapted and changed and how can we also analyse that those movements? And um, I think a lot of platforms 
are, I guess, are driven by the way the platform originally is being used. So, for example, Facebook sort of dictated how we would use Facebook until we caught up with it. And then we've sort of moved on and they're like, well, they're trying to catch up now with the way that humans use the platform and sort of analyzing that. And also that there's so many out there that you can't put all your eggs in one basket either. And the way that we, I guess, um, consume marketing material or make buying decisions, it's even if they don't realize that they might not be using something like Facebook, they still would probably be getting advertisement through it in some sort of way. So there's so many digital touch points and I try and get them to think about like an omni digital presence where there's not just, you know, you don't just have one shop front or just one website and you're easy to find. You kind of have to be a little bit everywhere. So yeah, it's a, yeah, get them to think outside the box, sort of like what Jess was saying. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Matt, just going into thinking about into the international perspective, you've had success with parlor gigs internationally. How did you do that? How did you break from Australia and, and manage to have gigs all around the world? Um, well, yeah, it was certainly healthier before the pandemic. So we're sort of starting to come back now overseas. Um, it was pretty simple, really, the momentum from this market in Australia and New Zealand. We just saw... Um, US um, and European artists sign up anyway because it, it's just a website and <laughs> people were just signing up. Um, and then, but then we, yeah, we didn't have multiple currencies set up yet. So um, until we had that, they couldn't actually use it. Um, but once that was in, we just saw people jump into it and start using it um, just from word of mouth. So, yeah, uh, the, the business has never marketed really a, a little bit of paid social, but mostly just um, word of mouth because artists, as we know, are very difficult, to, very hard to market to. So it's usually just um, going to be their friends telling them that it's a good idea. Um, so that's that, yeah. Wow, and that kind of goes against our whole, <laughs> what we're trying to sell <laughs> here about digital marketing. Well, <laughs> you don't need well, it, word of mouth. <laughs> well, they like without social, you know, we're, we're a, Parlor is a piggyback business. So without social, it doesn't work at all. So, you know, most artists that use us have the Parlor Geeks um, profile link in their link tree. So it's like just yeah. in a plate of the house and that, that's the main way that they collect um, fan offers. Has there been a few copycats since you started that? Has it started a bit of a trend? Yeah, I think like every every year there's a couple, yeah. Um, some yeah. of them have raised millions and millions of dollars. Um, one US-based one has raised about $30 million. And, um, yeah, I, so like it's interesting to watch the space heat up and I, I really, it's exciting because um, I see this, as a, this model as an important part of how artists do live work in the future, particularly emerging and mid-market artists that aren't, you know, um, killing it and playing big shows every night. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I realise I haven't spoken about my um, experience in the classroom yet, but I, this all ties right. back somehow, yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll ask that question. We'll. Okay, good. good. <laughs> um, so, Jess, how, um, how do you prepare students for the international context? So I guess uh, particularly it depends on because I teach a couple of different units and, and have taught, you know, a, a range of units, um, you know, from presenting yourself professionally for artists, you know, developing a portfolio. So, you know, in the cases for the musicians and the artists, it's how do they present something that is going to connect with an audience and how do you actually present something that's uh, ready-made for industry. So maybe those um, non-public facing tools um, and then you know through to entrepreneurship it's uh, we have um, at Collats we've got some students who have launched their own ventures so they might have launched a management company um, you know they have started a record label um, and you know through those experiences students kind of um, I guess, uh, fast track their experience by, you know, in Australia, we're quite quite kind of removed from the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, through the pandemic, there hasn't been, a, a, you know, in 
international travel. But one of the great things um, that's been happening this year is with the borders all opening up. Um, you know, I've actually been following students on Instagram and they're, you know, seeing them over at the Great Escape and seeing them at South by Southwest and actually getting to those um those export export market um, trade fairs and and kind of uh, you know students are able to you know if they're from coming from a business perspective they're kind of able to go network and, and experience and connect um, in the ways that we used to before the pandemic as well um, but yeah I think in terms of preparing students it really depends on um, on on the aspirations of of students as well because I think we have. Um, some students who, you know, they, they really know the local community and they want to connect with the community that they they know and, and um, you know, others really have that idea of, well, I want to, you know, I've got aspirations to have an international career and I want to kind of, path, path, you know, take my own path and, and pave that way. So they, you know, we've had students who've gone back and moved back to the UK and, and working at major labels and things like that. So... In terms of preparation, it kind of depends on their story and, and what, what their aspirations are. And, and um, But on a more practical application, um, you know, I spend time, um, I guess, speaking to my personal experience, you know, being at those, um, you know, places like, uh, you know, The Great Escape and, and I guess, you know, the, the way that you can um, uh, connect and, you know, build, I guess, your own profile internationally as well through um, particularly with talent management and artist management um, and connecting with other other like-minded um, people. So, yeah, that's probably, I guess, yeah, it's sort of lots of different facets in, in some more um, direct kind of ways where we talk about how to market, um, you know, internationally and abroad for, for talent and then, um, I guess, more... Um, you know, uh, behind the scenes where students kind of use those networking um, tools and, and ways of connecting, uh, but to an international context. And you have a bit of a mixed bag with the students, don't you? Because you have some classes that are entertainment management who are all focused and have an understanding of the whole music business, but then you also have classes of just musicians who have less understanding of, of the business and because their whole studies is focused on their craft. So how that is that more challenging for you to teach the musicians the marketing side of things or do you just Yeah, think? I guess yeah, it's a it's a really good question because I think both students are looking for different things. Um, you know, I think, you know, the students that I'm teaching uh, that are musicians and artists you know, they're, they're not necessarily thinking about how everything applies in a business sense um, and they're kind of at the beginnings, even though they're at the end of their course, they've, you know, really focused on their craft and their songwriting and they're just articulating their vision and, uh, and their artistic vision. Um, and it's probably at that stage where I kind of frame it as though I'm giving you a vignette, like we can only kind of cover the very, very, very top line um, elements here um, that relate to you personally. Um, but for a more in-depth, um, uh, I guess, uh, investigation, that's where I kind of encourage people to, you know, if they want to do the double degree, um, that's where they're going to be able to kind of develop that business um, skill set. Um, or, you know, if I have I had a meeting with a, a student, a couple of, like who graduated a year or two ago who was a music student um, and she has kind of, you know, part, she's on her own direction where she's like, I know what I want to do now. I see how this subject that I did a year or two ago actually fits into, you know, how I want to build my career, but I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to, like, talk to people. I'm going to network. I'm going to go to different workshops and things like that. So, yeah, so I think they have different, different approaches, but it's also they're at different stages of what they're looking to get out of the experience. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Laura, so um, could you maybe for some of the teachers in the room, maybe share some of your useful strategies around community building when you're teaching? Yeah, I guess um, this is my first try teaching. So at Coll Arts, I've done a couple of semesters at another university. But I think um, with community building, when it comes to what it, their fan base, or just, you know, their own personal connections and everything like that. A big thing that I've been talking to them about is authenticity as well. Um, I think 
you know, it is a huge trend at the moment to not only show your accomplishments or, you know, that sort of, uh, I guess, face fronting sort of um, content. It's more about that little behind the scenes now as well, a lot more where it's not just how you create your music or what you do, but what you stand up for and, you know, a bit more personal. So I think teaching them um, a bit about that authenticity, but also community management is a huge thing that I talk to them about as well, which is that other side of social and digital where you're monitoring people's comments and dealing with conflicts. And sometimes when you are talking about, you know, issues that you stand up for, whether it be political or just your general beliefs, you have to really back yourself. So whether um, I have sometimes have a guest lecturer in who's worked for really big brands like Fonz and um, Kiki K and other businesses and talking about some of the struggles they have when they are, you know, whether they have like a endorsement and they get a bit of conflict on their social platforms and everything, but teaching them how to deal with that sort of conflict as well as part of their community. So also teaching them how to protect themselves and protect their identity. Yeah, yeah, protecting themselves or just like I guess a small part of crisis management that you can kind of have like preparing that no matter what happens, there's always going to be trolls or bullying or, or things like that. But like don't be scared, just be prepared and just, you know, stay authentic I think yeah I can't say it enough that authenticity and that human connection whether it is whether you are promoting a festival or an artist page or a label like and you see it a lot more with those you know brands and businesses that aren't like a single identity that is a festival or something like that um, teaching the students that people really connect with a human, even if it's not a real sort of human, but, you know, having that identity of familiarity with their audience and, yeah, built to build that community. So is that part of it as well where students have to think about what makes me authentic, what is my identity? Like do they go through some of that thinking before they present themselves on the socials? E- yeah, so what we do in class, I do, um, I talk about tone of voice, but also brand identity and brand personality. So I have like a questionnaire, it might be like 10 questions that has nothing to do with like the business, like what the services are or products that are sold, but it just has to do with an identity and whether it's um, whether you're talking about a band or a business, they answer it as a singular person. So like creating that person, like a character sheet. And I try and say to them that, you know, on your social media, think or any of your branding, think of it like acting with words, you get into character and you can give this character sheet to anybody and they'll know how to articulate your business in the way that you want. So yeah, we, do that first. So you sort of have like your target market idea and everything. And then your brand, and then we go into the brand personality before they start doing really anything else and before they plan any content or any of that kind of thing. Cause it helps them like whether they're posting in general, they'll know what their tone of voice and how to articulate that. Or if they are dealing with like a conflict or something like that, they'll know how to articulate that as well. And we, also talk about their brand besties so they're like best friends that help them they don't necessarily have to be within the music or entertainment industry but it helps them kind of align with okay what other businesses would I be friends with that may not necessarily be in my industry but it just helps create like a bigger picture of who their business really is. Mm. That's that sounds like a really useful exercise I imagine that the students would really enjoy that. Yeah, well. they laugh a little bit too because it's yeah. yeah, it's not necessarily their business and what it does. So they can kind of have fun with creating those characters, which is nice. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So Matt, now you're you've got a skill base that's kind of new in that you're dealing with NFTs and and blockchain and all of these different technologies that are 
that are fairly new-ish to the music industry. So you've got quite an asset to the students at CollArts and got incredible feedback for teaching that um, about those technologies. So can you just tell us a little bit about how you've brought your knowledge from your business into the classroom and, and the kind of things that you teach? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm very new to teaching, so I'm still figuring it all out. Um, but uh, the first thing I do um, at the beginning of the trimester is um, I find out what each student is interested in doing when they leave CollArts. Um, and I find that most students, maybe so far anyway, about 90% have a good sense of what that is, whether they want to be a, ma a manager or um, they want to be an artist or they want to work in publishing. Um, it seems to be, and often marketing as well. Um, and so once I have that information, I kind of store that on a little spreadsheet that I pull up every class and I try and tie that back. Um, anything that I bring in, whether it be yeah, about talking about how the music industry is changing with this new technology um, uh, or, or if, even if I'm talking about design thinking or, you know, how we solve problems um, with that sort of methodology, it's about. Um, tying it back to what students are um, personally interested in. I've found that so far to be good in terms of engagement. Um, so I'm not just sort of, you know, <laughs> throwing, um, you know, these, these, this new information out and sort of hoping it'll land somewhere. Um, so that's where, yeah. Well, that's, that, that's, good. that's That's a good tip, Matt, I think, for all <laughs> of us. It's like, especially for a new teacher, I'm just thinking to myself, okay, because, I mean, our students are often uh, egocentric and I want it to yeah. be about them. But if you can totally. tailor the class, that, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, it's like, so, yeah, like future remuneration structures for artists are going to be super important if you want to manage an artist or, or several artists, right? So understanding um, how artists are going to make money, um, you know, when in my design thinking um, uh, unit, we um, the students get to solve a problem with technology that they're passionate about. Um, and most of them um, are uh, passionate about solving artist remuneration problems in the streaming era, uh, era, particularly from artists that sit in the middle part of the market that mm -hmm. make a hundred bucks a year from streaming. So they know that they've got fans out there that are consuming their music, but they feel like they're being shortchanged by that. Um, technology, whether that's true or not, that's the, the technology is what it is. But what do those future um, remuneration structures look like? What, how do NFTs play in? How will they, um, you know, help artists, um, you know, in increase their revenue in the future? Um, that's just, just one example. But, yeah, keep trying to tie it back to what they want to do when they leave. Um, uh, I find that to be the best tool to sort of keep them engaged with it. Do you find that students do know what know what they want to do when they leave? I find most do, yeah. And if they say um, in that introduction, I don't really have any idea. I'm like, well, what? Um, I like one of the questions I ask is like, if you go into a bookstore, what's the section you like to <laughs> go and check out? Or if you're, um, you know, like what? Why you? Why did you sign up to study at Collets at all? It's like, oh, I really like music, really like hip hop. Um, I've got my own music actually and record, you know, like, and so you sort of tease it out that way. Um, yeah. So eventually you get somewhere where they have a sense. There's very few that are like, I have no idea why I'm here, um, which is one of the wonderful things about call arts. I feel like when I went to university, I had no idea why I was there um, when, for my undergrad. So <laughs> that, but call arts students seem to be very clear on that. And I, that's one of the things I would just love about the school. Oh, well, that's awesome. Thank you. And Jess, you've, um, have you developed pedagogical structures that have been effective in, in your teaching or even more specific about community building or that you could share? Yeah, so um, I think this, is, this was kind of something that was, uh, I guess, slightly inherited but also something that um, I've kind of been refining and, and uh, I mentioned earlier that um, in uh, one, the, one of the applied units that I teach, um, students are really working. Uh, it, it's very much like a, a students kind of have, they manage an artist for a trimester or they manage some kind of talent, whether that might be a model or a, an influencer or, um, you know, I've had um, some students work with like a, a gaming collective 
Um, so it's a rank, you know, they, they really get to choose who they work with and, and that essentially um, articulates what kind of goals and things that they're going to be working on over the course of the trimester. Um, and I think in terms of the pedagogical structure, um, we have, um, I guess, uh, it's set up so that um, they kind of pitch their, their, their talent to the class as their first assessment, um, you know, talk to, I guess, the, the top line strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, areas for development um, from what they know in the beginning. Now, some students are working with people that they know, but some students are working with people that actually have, are just getting to know at the start um, of the class. And, um, and then, you know, over the course of the trimester, we kind of alternate between fortnightly um, meetings um, where it's kind of small group individualised catch-up um, within that class time um, through to a whole group collective kind of discussion and, and workshop. Um, and the interesting thing that I found about how that's shifted from in the classroom that used to kind of work really, uh, I guess, easily because you just... You know, you'd, you'd, you'd kind of be in the classroom physically and then you just have people coming up one by one and just talking or having like little small group discussion. But I think, um, you know, as we've kind of shifted into online, um, that's definitely become a little bit more structured. And I actually had, you know, more individual meetings set up with the students. Um, but some of the feedback that I got from students was, although they like that full class, uh, you know, whole group discussion they actually really get a lot from that small group discussion that's more um uh i guess tailored to their experiences so like last trimester i had a really interesting group i had kind of a bigger class of about um a bigger class so we kind of had to schedule things a little bit differently and and it was really interesting we had a group that were like working with um you know actors comedians um, and I guess non-music um, talent. And so we were able to kind of put together some, some different groups focusing on strategies and, and topics that related to them specifically because um, I think that's one of the things at Collarts we have a lot of people do the course, the entertainment management course, are particularly interested in music, but we also have students who want to kind of step out um, and, and apply that experience to other contexts like visual arts. And and um, and, and I think, uh, yeah, in particular, that class seems to be an opportunity to do that. So it's been interesting to kind of shift between um, and to find that balance between, um, between the classes, but I think having the small group um, specific times has been really helpful and it means that students kind of get that feeling that it's really a mentoring relationship and I get to give, you know, well, have you thought about this or this kind of advice rather than um, a whole kind of class where uh, class context where students kind of um, maybe don't necessarily feel they can ask all those questions um, or maybe you can kind of hide a little bit as well. So that's probably like the biggest pedagogical structure for, for that class. Um, uh, and that I found that's worked, yeah. And and is that working particularly because you've remained that class has remained online? Uh, I think um, that one on one face to face. Yeah, I think it, it, there is there is an element of of it that works really well online because um, you know students are able to get uh, you know I think when we were doing it in the in, in the whole class, I definitely, you know, attendance could sometimes be an issue, um, you know, when with travelling because we have students sort of in different places. And, and I think um, with the demographic of students now, you know, there are they are located all around Australia. So it means that, um, you know, they get to have that small group time with people that they know in the classroom, but also, you know, they're getting exposed to their classmates' different experiences. So, you know, I definitely found when we kind of had had it in um, face-to-face, um, you know, there was, yeah, it was a different kind of dynamic, but this is kind of, um, yeah, it's been, it's been working. Oh, excellent. I'd just like to say we're going to finish in a few minutes. So if anyone is online and has a question for any of our panellists, please pop them in the chat. And, um, and, and we'll certainly ask those questions before we wrap up. Uh, so, Laura, I just um, wanted to, you might have seen, maybe not, that uh, we ha the conference had a guest speaker from Vibrate. Now, that's not something that we use here in Australia. So can you talk about what aggregators we do use here? 
Yeah, I think the main one which Jess sort of was mentioning was chart metric is what we use a lot or like I've used it personally for my artists and with what I do as well. So it's something that I teach the students a little bit about how to get all that aggregated information and make better um, decisions based on data. But obviously, um, as, as some of them are music artists themselves, you know, paying that kind of higher level fee when you want to get more information can be quite costly. So I do teach them how they can get it through the different applications as well, like through natively through Facebook, Google Analytics, um, you know, all of those things as well as scheduling platforms such as Hootsuite, Latergram, all of that. Um, There's also another one which I teach them called Sprout, which is more of a social media specific tool. Um, But as, again, a lot of them are music artists or working within the music industry, um, having a tool that, you know, sort of aggregates Spotify and YouTube and all of that is really important. Um, I I guess I'll probably say the name wrong, but Vibrate, I hadn't used that one before or sort of seen it. And I think it's really important to sort of show students what else is out there. And um, a lot of the tools that I've found is even just through word of mouth with asking people, because where I come from is more of a, or like the last few years has been more e-com. So more um, consumer goods and everything like that. So I haven't been as familiar with the aggregated tools towards music industry um, just in the last little while. And I found that chart metric, like it was just amazing how easy it was to bring everything in. You didn't have to necessarily be managing a page. So when it comes to um, being a publicist or being, you know, even working on a label, you don't need to have the logins for everybody's stuff. And I found that very, very useful when you're working with clients. So, or even just trying to um, analyze your competition a little bit as well, seeing how they're doing. It's a very powerful and useful thing to use. Excellent. We have got a question in the chat. So um, first saying super inspiring to listen to this. So how can we inspire the students to build their international networks and utilize them? So Jesse touched on that. So maybe uh, Laura, would you mind answering that question? Yeah, I think um, like, you know, whether you are using socials or you're using other means to network, it's super important. Like I know myself as an artist, I've been able to get shows internationally in the US and Europe through building that community. And I think, you know, there's there's even tools out there. There's something called uh, I'll probably I'll get it wrong, but there's um there's a platform where you can like upload your music as a producer and get feedback from artists all around the world. And I find things like that is really handy. And because A lot of the time in music, you don't need to be in the same country or city as another artist. Like you can be working with producers all around the world and, um, you know, looking at the stats of, okay, well, where is my audience? I'm going to make sure that I'm actively connecting with other people, I think is really important. And just showing them, yeah, the real world examples of, building that community like I work with an artist called Dirty Versace they've only been around for about a year as Dirty Versace and every time they get someone adding them on Instagram they'll message them and start having conversations with them no matter where they are in the world and it just makes it easier like if they went to the US they would potentially already have a fan base built of loyal followers or if there was an opportunity, so for example, I have another artist who wants to go to Berlin, like my networking makes it then a lot easier for them to go to a foreign country they've never been to and be able to, you know, feel safe as well. Like feel like, okay, I have someone that my manager knows personally who's going to like take care of me or show me the ropes a little bit here. So yeah, I think the real world examples is really important. 
Oh, that, that's amazing. Thank you so much. We, we kind of have to wrap it up now. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you so much for your time and your insight. You're my colleagues, but I and we talk, but I've still taken away a lot from this conversation. So, um, Chrissy, have you got any final words or just no, a, yeah. not at all. Um, I thought it was just so inspiring. I would have actually just, I'd like Matt to wrap it up by by talking about that whole how can you build and inspire students to um, build their international networks. Can you add to anything that um, that Laura just said? Because that was just really interesting. Yeah, it was great. Um, I, I mean, Laura touched on so much, but, but I, I sort of remind students that um, you're global from day one. So when if you're an artist, you're uploading your music, um, you might start finding it catching on in particular markets and your um, job then is to find a way to fan the flames in those markets and, and build community in those places. So, yes, there's the digital um, aspect to that via socials, but how can we um, do that in, in other and more interesting novel ways as well? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just a, just a constant reminder that, it, that, we're, that we're global all the time. <laughs> it's not just, you know, um, one market that we're in. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. Yeah. Great way to finish it. We are global. Yes, um, we are global. Yeah. <laughs> and we certainly are <laughs> right at this moment. We, we literally watch go from dark to night where everyone's going the opposite and most people who are listening to us. So um, yeah. thank you so much again for your time and thank you for everyone who's participated today. And I'd like to hand over to Armin now.